Amen. Let's take our Bibles tonight and open together, please, to the book of 1 Samuel, uh, chapter number 17. We come again to the Word of God tonight, and our hearts are praying and, and seeking the Lord that God would continue uh, to encourage our hearts and challenge us in this area of counting for Jesus. And uh, only one life will soon be passed, and only what's done for Christ will last. I'm reminded of, of our Sunday school lesson from this morning in Psalm 90. Of course, uh, Moses is writing. It's the Psalm of Moses, and um, he references life. He references, he references the length of life. And uh, certainly the Bible says there, he says, So let us teach us to number our days, that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. I want, I want to live my life for His glory. It's amazing that, uh, that you and I, who will live for eternity, you know, we, we all have a beginning. Uh, we believe, uh, based upon the authority of Scripture, that life begins at the moment of conception. Right. And from that point, you and I, we are a living soul. And our soul will live on, we will live on for all eternity. In either heaven or, or in a place the Bible calls hell. And I'm thankful that Jesus Christ came to this world, died on the cross, paid the penalty of our sin, rose again from the grave, and, and offers salvation to all who will come to Him by faith. And at the moment of salvation, we, we're, be, we're begotten again under this lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And, and now we have this new life. The Bible says, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Uh, the Bible says, Whereas by, uh, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And God has given us this new life. And we're thankful for the blessing of eternity, the, the knowledge of our salvation, which is, which is true. It's, a, it's a, the true salvation. There's, neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And so salvation only comes through Christ. It's only through Jesus that we have our sins forgiven. It's only through Christ that we have hope for eternity. And, and we are to take the life that God has gifted us with. Because life is a gift. Time is a gift. Everything, every, good, every good gift is from above, cometh down from the Father of lights. Everything we have, God wants us to take and implement for His glory. And, and the life that we now live in the flesh, we live by the faith of the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us. And so now we take our lives and we, we invest them in the Lord's work. Do you realize there are people that are looking for meaning? There are so many different things that are taking the place of God in the world today. Of course, John already tells us in 1 John that, that even now is there a spirit of antichrist in the world. And this is nothing new but we look at so many different things uh, that, uh, that, are, that are taking the place of the Lord. Do you realize that there is a, 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 a shrinking segment of the world's population that is actually religiously engaged? And this is just a general statement, just rig religiously engaged, where they go to church, they, they uh, really consider the things of, the things of God, whether we, would under, whether we would agree with them or not. They're just, they don't just that religious segment of the world is shrinking. And in its place, because you and I are created, for a, we have a hunger, we have, we have something in our hearts that, that seeks to worship. Yes, right. And because people no longer are religiously engaged does not mean that that desire to worship is gone. Right. So instead, we find people who worship science. Yeah. We find people who worship politics. We find people who worship money. We find people who worship hobbies and, and personal self-interest. People that worship themselves. Yeah. But, but the, the reality is, you, you and I, we're not created for any of those other things. We're created for God alone. For His pleasure, yeah. we are and we're created. And so tonight we come again to 1 Samuel chapter 17. And remember, David, he's battling Goliath. And uh, as, he, as he first finds out that there's, a, that there's a need, he addresses that. I want to read just two verses tonight by way of introduction. If you please stand with me as we read God's Word together. Uh, I'd like for us to begin in 1 Samuel chapter 17, uh, beginning, of course, in verse number 29. 
The Bible says in 1 Samuel chapter 17 and verse 29, and David said, what have I now done? Is there not a cause? Let's skip ahead in the same chapter. We'll read over in verse number 46. The Bible says, this day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee and take thine head from thee, and I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air, unto the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Father, we're thankful that we know there is a God. Truly, all of mankind knows there's a God. The heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament showeth forth His handiwork. Lord, we have the law of God written in our hearts. Lord, we know that, you, that there is a God, but we're thankful for the Scriptures who, who introduce us to you, the one true and living God. And Lord, tonight we ask that you would help us as we come to the Scriptures, that you would teach us what uh, is required concerning this cause that all the earth may know, that we would pattern our lives appropriately, that we would set you as uh, in, in the preeminent place of our lives, that we would give you preeminence, and, and everything in our life, Lord, would be ordered in accordance with that. And so, Lord, we pray that you'd give us an earnest desire to see your glory. Uh, Lord, that, we would, that there would be an intensity about us that strives to please thee in all things. Uh, a desire to obey. Lord, you tell us that obedience is better than sacrifice. So God, tonight we ask for your help that you would challenge us and that you would speak to us. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Again, if you're in the habit of marking things in your Bibles and you did not do what I instructed this morning, I encourage you uh, to mark these statements in your Bibles. The statements we just read, in verse number 29, we have our key text for the year that... Uh, is there not a cause? Remember, our prayer is that we would live a life that glorifies the Lord, that a life that truly counts for Jesus. You see, as I mentioned before, there are people who are, who are seeking things to worship. I'm reminded of, of what the Bible says in John chapter 4 when Jesus uh, met the woman, the Samaritan woman at the well, and, and she, she gave this great explanation about the history of the well and how their forefathers had, had drank from the well, and all, all their cattle had drank from the well, and, and, and how she, she said that the Jews say that they are to worship only in Jerusalem. And Jesus responded, ye worship, ye know not what. There are so many people today that are worshiping, they know not what. But God's desire is for all mankind to know that there is a God. That is the cause for which you and I are to live. Hold your place here in 1 Samuel chapter number 17 and turn with me please to the book of the Revelation of Jesus Christ. We see here God's intention. Of course we know that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. We know that, that, God, is, that God is true. We know that God is faithful and that God is seeking a people to worship Him. And the Bible says uh, in verse number 9 of Revelation chapter number 5, says, And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take of the book and to open the seals thereof, for Thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by the blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. What is God seeking? Well, even Jesus told the woman at the well that the Father seeketh such to worship Him. Consider the fact that God wants to take our lives and use us to bring lost people to Him because He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Uh, we, God, God desires for all men to be saved and come under the knowledge of the truth because the Lord is looking to amass a choir of every kindred, every nation, every tribe, every tongue 
What's the purpose of this choir? It's to worship the Lamb that was slain. God wants, God is hungry for worshipers. Will you worship the Lord? Will you be a true worshiper? And if we live our lives as true worshipers, we're going to be, bring other people to worship our Lord. Remember, the Bible says the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. We glorify God according to John chapter 15 by bearing fruit. Jesus says, so shall you be my disciples. I want to live a life that counts for Jesus. Is there not a cause? Are we living for this cause? Are we living to glorify God by telling other people about Christ so that they can repent of their sin and by faith trust in the Lord and begin worshiping God? That's, that's, really the, that's really the purpose we're here. That's bare bones. This is the cause. This is the cause for which you and I are to live. That all the earth may know there is a God in Israel. And as we consider this cause tonight, we, we saw even this morning, number one, that His cause will keep us on the right course. It'll order our paths. It will keep us headed the right direction. But notice the second truth we find, we look in the, the same passage of Scripture, we find that His cause will help, help us to establish the right priorities. We talk at length about priorities and preeminence, and, and I even made the statement that if we want others to give God priority, then we must learn to, to make Him preeminent. In, in our lives, God deserves the preeminence. And as we consider David, this man after God's own heart, he was a young boy at the time, was David a perfect man? Was David, was David a sinless man? David was not a perfect man. He was not a sinless man. Uh, he was a murderer. And I'm not talking about all the lives that he had taken in battle. See, there's, there's a difference between lives taken in battle and lives taken in murder. God, there's a, there's a stark difference. But David, he was a warrior. He killed Goliath. People wrote songs about his valor. Saul has killed his thousands, but David has killed his ten thousands. But David killed Uriah to hide his sin. David was a murderer. He was an adulterer. There are many areas in David's life where he was an abysmal failure. But he's still described by God as a man who lit, a man after God's own heart. What does this mean? It means that David was a true worshiper of God. He was not a perfect man, but David was not an idolater. David, I believe, had, had a heart of pure motives. That sweet psalmist of Israel, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He, was a, he, he learned from his, from his early youth to, to give Christ, to give God preeminence in his life. And Christians, we must learn to give God priority. Look what the Bible says back in Colossians, holding your place here in 1 Samuel, a passage that we referenced this morning. Colossians chapter number 1. Of course, before we read in chapter 1, I'd like to read in chapter number 2, in verse number 9. Because the world will have us order our lives according to what it values most. And let me tell you, the, what the world values is not, are, are not the same things as what God values. What does the world value? The world values the temporal things. The world values money. It values success or what is apparent success or what is deemed to be success. Uh, the world values all kinds of things that, that are, to, are of little to no value to God. The Bible says in Colossians chapter 2 and verse number 9, it says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy, uh, through uh, philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. So, Paul, he's saying, hey, listen here. Don't fall prey to what the world deems necessary, to what the world says is important or valuable. Don't let the world dictate 
how you live your life. Does the world tell you what to do? Well, we get up every week and we go to work and and we, we work and we take orders. That's not the same thing. You've got to get up. You need to go to work. Uh, the Bible tells, tells us, uh, let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, okay? So you and I are to get up or to go to work. Uh, the Bible tells us, men, if we fail to care for the needs of our family, we're worse than an infidel. It's important that we work. We find, we find joy in work most, time, most of the time, except on Mondays, right? Mondays are always a struggle. There's identity in our work. There's satisfaction in our work. Just recently, we, uh, we were able to put windows in our house, and uh, for two days, we, we, we trimmed them out inside, which was a feat in and of itself. Don't look too close, okay? I'm not a finished carpenter, but I am cheap. And, um, and don't look too closely, but... It's, it's nice. We worked, had my boys help me, and we took a step back. It's like, boys, doesn't that look good? There's satisfaction in a job that you do well. I'm not saying it was well done, but we tried our very best, you know? Because God wants us to glorify Him. Everything we do, we can, we can glorify God with. But, but you and I... Sometimes you think, you know what, the, well, the world says that, that I have to do this. The world tells me that I need that in order to, to, to be deemed a success. That's not the case. What did Jesus own? Jesus said, foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. Jesus didn't own anything. And he's the victor. We would say that his life was a great success. He's the author and finisher of our faith. And I don't, I'm not saying go out and sell everything you have and live in the gutter. But what I am telling you is be content with what you have. The Bible says godliness with contentment is great gain. Don't, go, don't feel like you have to go and keep up with the Joneses. Understand that, that you and I, we're not to live in comparing ourselves to the world and seeking after the things that the world says you've got to have in order to find success, in order to find fulfillment. If you want fulfillment in life, if you want happiness, just live a life that counts for Jesus. Do what He says is important. Place the value where Christ places the value. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. Jesus will take care of you if you're His child and you're living your life for Him. David said he'd been young and he'd been old, yet in all his days he had not seen the righteous forsaken or a seed begging for bread. But we look here and we understand the priorities and, and understanding our lives. It's not about us. It's not about what I want. It's not about what others have. It's about what Christ has for us. And Christ has set forth this cause before us. And we're to live for the cause of Christ, for His glory. Look what the Bible says in Colossians chapter number 1. In verse number 16, it says, For by Him were all things created that are in heaven, and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by Him and for Him. And He is before all things, and by Him all things consist. And He is the head of the body, the church, which is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things He might have the preeminence. Now that word might in verse number 18 is not an indefinite article. It's a definite article. In other words, this is, this is what God desires. This isn't wishful. This isn't a possibility. This is the determination of our hearts. That, that in all things, He might have the preeminence. You know, sometimes in our, in our modern vernacular, 
in our modern speech, you say, well, I might go to Chick-fil-A. I might not. I might go uh, to the store. I might not. See, there's a possibility of it not happening. But in God's desire for our lives, it is His will that it take place. And this is something, this is a decision that you and I must logically make and understand that if our lives will count for Christ, He must have the preeminence. Not a preeminence, the preeminence. There are other things vying for the Lord's place in our lives. There are other things, uh, desires, and, and may I say they're not all bad things? Not, every, not everything that takes God's place is a bad thing. There are good things. You know, work, it's not bad. The Lord tells us to work. Family, children, those aren't bad things, but they can bad things if they're misprioritized. If they steal the place of God from our lives, it's bad. The blessing becomes a curse if it takes God's place. The Bible says that in all things, he might have the preeminence. We must learn in our lives to not allow anything to usurp the Lord's place in our hearts. Don't let something or someone steal the Lord's preeminence in your life. You're not created for things. You're created for the Lord. You're not created for people. You're created for the Lord. You're not created for you. You're created for the Lord. That in all things he might have the preeminence. Notice the second lesson that we learn. I'm sorry, the third lesson we learn. Back in 1 Samuel chapter 17. Concerning this cause for which we live. Uh, to count for Jesus, we understand that his cause demands a sacrifice. His cause demands a sacrifice. Was there a sacrifice made in 1 Samuel chapter 17 in this portion of the story? Well, there was no altar erected. Uh, there was no animal slain. There was no blood applied. There was no fire. There was no flame. Well, what was the sacrifice? I believe David was the sacrifice. He sacrificed himself. There's no one else here that's going to stand up and there's no one else here that's going to, to go out and, and face this formidable foe. There's no one else here that's going to go and, and stand before this, this giant of a man, literally a giant of a man. There's no one here that will in, endanger his life so that others can live David said, I'll be that man. Look what the Bible says in verse number 31. It says, and, and when the words were heard which David spake, they rehearsed them before Saul, and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Notice, underline the statement in your Bible. He says, thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Thy servant will will go. Have you ever told that to the Lord? When's the last time that you, you have told God that you would go? And we'll say, go where? It doesn't matter. Just don't tell Him no. Just tell Him you'll go. Be available. So oftentimes we say, God, I can't do that. Uh, I don't like it that way, so I'm not going to do that. Right? Don't allow personal preference to, to keep you from serving the Lord. Don't allow some, some, some false sense of uh, idea that you carry keep you from, from, from serving the Lord. Can you imagine, what would, how would the story have unfolded had David said no? Or sat idly by? Instead, he endangered himself for everyone else. He gave himself. He, you know, at this time in his life, this was a step of faith. David was a young man, just a, a young man, maybe 12, 13 years old, perhaps. He had just been anointed uh, to be the future king over all Israel. What that meant, he wasn't sure. He was, just a, he was just a young man, just a young shepherd boy, tending his father's flock. It's interesting, even after David was anointed 
he, he, his dad said, I don't really care. Get back out there and, and watch the sheep. Well, I'm the king. I'm the next king of Israel. I don't care. You're still a kid in my house. Now you get out there and you, you watch my sheep. Can you imagine the conversation that he had? But this was an act of faith. What has God called you and me to do with our lives? Well, in Romans chapter 12, of course, the Bible says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. Holy, acceptable God, which is your reasonable service. The least, the least thing you, you and I can do is give our lives to the Lord. It's our reasonable service. It's not unreasonable. It's the least we can do is to give our lives for the Lord. Give our lives to the Lord. Every ounce of energy, all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our strength, all of our might. May God help us serve him in that capacity. No restraint. Much like William Borden of Yale who wrote in his diary, no reserves, no retreats, no regrets. Listen to what the Bible says in Isaiah. Turn there with me if you would. Isaiah chapter number 6. Again, the proper vision of God settles everything. Where there is no vision, the people perish, but he that keep the law, happy is he. In Isaiah chapter 6, the prophet of God caught a fresh glimpse of the Lord, and it changed him completely. In Isaiah chapter 6, the prophet was living in a in a transitionary time in the history of Israel, King Uzziah had died. There had been a great earthquake. All those things had taken place. There was some uncertainty surrounding the kingdom. But the Bible says in verse number 1 of Isaiah 6, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon the throne. Mark that statement, I saw also the Lord. Everything else was going, around, going on around him. You know, there's a lot of things that we see taking place in the world today, but it, I don't want to look at those things. I want to see the Lord. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord. We live in 2022, 2020, 2021. They were a train wreck, man. They were a dumpster fire. There was a lot of things that we could look at and think, Ugh, I don't want that again. I don't want to deal with that. A lot of uncertainty. A lot of people lost their jobs. Even today, there's a, threat, a great threat of unemployment. There's the changing economy. The world is, has, will never be the same. This is a great transitionary time in history. But you know what makes the difference? We keep our eyes on the Lord. He said, I saw also the Lord sitting upon his throne, and his train filled the temple. The Bible says, above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The Bible says, and the posts of the doors moved at the voice of him that, that, that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, woe is me, for I am undone, because, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Would you mark that statement? Mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Christians, tonight your sin has been purged. What would be unqualifying? is no longer there. Colossians chapter 3 speaks of that. Or, or Colossians chapter 2 speaks of that. I'm sorry, how the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, Christ took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross, Amen. triumphing openly in them. We're thankful that our sins have been forgiven. So what, what kept us from serving God no longer keeps us from serving the Lord. Our sins have been forgiven. The Bible goes on to say, and he says, and I heard the voice of the Lord saying, now listen, listen, what is the voice of the Lord saying? 
Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? So what did the voice of the Lord say? He says, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And notice the response of the prophet Isaiah. The same verse, verse number 8. Then said I, Here am I, send me. Did Isaiah know all that would befall him? Did Isaiah know how, how life was going to unfold? Don't, sometimes we, we like to think, well, I will do it only if I know how the end will be. You know, that's foolish. None of us know, boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day will bring forth. I don't know what will happen a second from now. Let alone a year from now, ten years from now, a decade from now, a century from now, a millennium from now, we don't know. This life is limited. The only thing I can do is a, with great abandon. Now, this is, now, when we use the word abandon, it doesn't mean carelessness. Uh, it just means with utter abandon. We, we just give ourselves to the Lord with no restraints. That's exactly what David did. He said, I will go, I will fight this, this giant. I will go fight the Philistine. I will sacrifice myself. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Christian, your life is hid with God in Christ. You can't lose it. The Lord is, the Lord is keeping you you are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. You cannot lose it, but you can squander it. You can't lose it, but you can misuse it. And I don't want to lose, I don't want to misuse it. I don't want to squander it. I want to give my life as a living sacrifice to the Lord. And we understand the cause for which you and I are to live. If we're going to live a life that will count for Jesus, we must be willing to make that sacrifice. Notice the next lesson that we learned tonight. Back in 1 Samuel chapter number 17. Number 4. It's that his cause requires more than the energy of the flesh. His cause requires more <clears throat> than the energy of the flesh. Do you know why? Because it's bigger than you. It's bigger than me. And we cannot do it on our own. We cannot accomplish the cause of Christ. We cannot accomplish world evangelism. We cannot live the Christian life. We cannot live a life that glorifies God on our own. We can try. And many do try to live for Christ alone. To live for Christ on their own. To live, their, to live for Christ in the strength of the flesh, in the arm of the flesh, to no avail. I believe that so many times Christians carry guilt because we, we exert all of this energy, this personal energy that we have, physical emotional, mental energy, trying to live for God without Him. And then we fail. And we think, I'm such a failure. How can, how can God love me? How can God be pleased with me? I'm, ooh. But you can't live for God that way. The only thing you can do is take God at His word. You just got to trust Him. And realize that it's bigger than you and no amount of energy that you can throw at it is sufficient. We were watching, scanning through the television channels last night. We came across this, this strongman competition. How many of you guys have ever watched the strongman competition? Man alive. They, they pull semi-trucks. That's not right. 
It'd be like me. I know, I'm, I mean, I'm an intimidating guy. I mean, I get it. It'd be like me trying to go out and push a fully loaded tanker truck off the side of the road by myself as it's broken down on I-70. There's no way I could do it. There's no way any of us in this room could do it. Now, understand, those strongman competitions, those are a joke. I mean, they're pulling little itty-bitty European trucks around. It's not like American stuff. I mean, it's not some Peterbilt or Kenworth. It's a Volvo, right? It's an Azuzu. I don't know. Whatever. But the truth of the matter is, so oftentimes we try to live the Christian life, we just can't do it. And we, we exert ourselves to no avail. And you know what? We even injure ourselves when we seek to live for Christ without Him. One of these strongman competitions, I was watching this man, he put on that harness, you know, and he got down as low as he could, and he started to pull that, to pull that, that semi-truck down this road. And his shoes came apart. And he didn't stop. They get, hold on, guy. Your shoes can't even handle this. And what had happened, the pavement ripped, the, ripped the, the balls of his feet, ripped the hide right off the balls of his feet. Like, you got to be kidding me. This guy's bleeding. And some, you know, some Eastern European guy's like, it was worth it. You know, like, whatever, man. <laughs> it's crazy. Like, there's no way. It's not worth it. To live for Christ without Him, it's, it's, it's a waste of time. There's no amount of energy, no, no amount of personal strength you have that will avail. Look what the Bible says in verse number 33, 1 Samuel chapter 17. The Bible says, And Saul said to David, Thou art not able. Thou art not able. Christian, not to be a, a discouragement tonight, but you are not able. You can't do it. You cannot live for Christ on your own. But I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. The Lord says, my strength is made perfect in weakness. And this is the victory that overcometh the world. Even our faith. We must learn to trust the Lord. Look what the Bible says in verse number 45. After David had listened to all the naysayers, his brothers told him that he was naughty. The king said he's not able. He puts the armor upon him. His own armor. He puts his armor on David. David says, I can't do this. I can't even move. Can you imagine? Here's Saul, a man head and shoulders above everybody else. Here's a teenage boy. Here, wear my armor. Okay. You know? It's wild. Puts his helmet on him. The big coat of chain mail. Gives him his big honking sword. Not to mention his shield. All right, David, go fight him. Thou art not able. Some trust in chariots. Some in horses. But we will remember the name of the Lord our God. Yeah, amen. The Bible says in verse 45, Then said David to the Philistine, who had just told David that he was going to kill him and let the birds and the animals come and eat his dead body. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield. But I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. He says, look, I'm just coming here because nobody, you know, there's, there's nobody else that's going to do this, so I'm, I'm, the, I'm, the, I'm, the, I'm the guy that was nominated. No, that's not why David was there. He was there so God could prove a point. David was not there seeking his own glory. David was just there because he obeyed his dad. 
and went to check on the welfare of his brothers who were enlisted in Saul's army. And now David, <laughs> he's beyond the front line. Here's a military term, he's outside the wire. And here comes this giant. That, humanly speaking, could tear him limb from limb. With ease. He says, I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel. Christian, you can't do it, but the Lord can. You've got to trust in him. The Christian life is not meant to, be, meant to be lived in the flesh. It's meant to be lived according to the spirit of God who is in us. Christ in me. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. What was the fifth and final lesson that we see here tonight? It's that his cause is eternal. The cause, it's an eternal cause. You know what politics is? It's only for a time. You know what money is? It's only for a time. You know what hobbies are? They're only for a time. One day, everything on this earth will melt away, be burned up with a fervent heat. Or you're going to die, whatever comes first. The Bible says, it's appointed unto men once to die. After this, the judgment. When you die, whose shall these things be? The world lives for the here and now. The world lives for that which is temporal. You and I are to live for that which is eternal. The Bible tells us that we're to lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. The Bible says, where, for where your treasure is, there shall your heart be also. So what do you love? What do you treasure? Treasure the eternal. In verse number 46, the Bible says that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. It's eternal. This life that we live was three score years and ten. If by reason of strength it be four score years, which doesn't register a blip on the timeline of eternity, can influence and impact eternity in measureless ways. We've got to live for the cause. Is there not a cause? To count for Jesus. As we close tonight, look what the Word of God says in 1 John chapter, 1 John chapter 2. In 1 John chapter 2, the Word of God says this, beginning in verse number 15. The Bible says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. The world passeth away in the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Must have been back in 2011, maybe? Maybe 10 years, 11 years ago now? Wow, just, time flies, doesn't it? Traveled to New England 
I think I may have, I may have shared this story. I probably have. So forgive me, I'm going to tell it again. Traveled to New England. We were praying about starting a church. Obviously, the Lord led us here to start this church in 2013. But there were several cities that we had surveyed in New England, Connecticut specifically, and um, Vermont. But on our way to Vermont, we were driving through Massachusetts. And I was driving up the interstate, I forget what road number it was, but I passed this exit that said Northfield, Massachusetts. Oh, Northfield? I didn't realize I was that close to Northfield, Massachusetts. So I went up to Rutland, Vermont and came back. And on my way back to Boston, I'm going to stop and I'm going to stop off at, in Northfield, Massachusetts. I'm going to look around. Someone of great significance was born in Northfield, Massachusetts. A man by the name of Dwight L. Moody, D.L. Moody, Northfield, Massachusetts. And I got off the interstate, drove up the road, drove up into Northfield, and there was Mount Hermon School right there where uh, D.L. Moody would train preachers and have all these big camps and conferences. Went up, saw, saw his house that he, that he was raised in as, as a young boy before he was sent off to Boston where he was one to Christ Sunday school teachers by his Sunday school teacher. And I remember going through and I'm, like, I'm just like a kid in a candy store. I'm like, I'm going to see everything, right? There's only one problem. Like, everything was locked. So I'm like looking in the windows, and I come to this, this his sanctuary, this building that, he had, that they had built, where he would conduct all these crusades and meetings. It's an amazing building. And I was trying every door, and I found one unlocked. If it's unlocked, it's not technically breaking and entering. <laughs> It is trespassing, but it's not breaking and entering. The fine would be a little different. So I began to look around and walked all over that building, stood on the, stood in the, on the platform front and center where D.L. Moody would have mounted the pulpit and preached the word of God. And, and, I, and I, so, so I got down, I was walking around, and I, saw, I found this staircase that, that went up into this bell tower. And I started to walk up these stairs, and they were creaking, ur, 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 as I went up these steps. And I had an epiphany. In other words, God smacked some sense into me that day. He said, nobody knows you're in here. If you, if you fall in this bell tower, nobody's going to find you for weeks, you know. They're going to find the rental car parked outside, and... Uh, so I got down, but as I was walk, climbing down, I, looked, I just happened to look out one of these windows, and there was, there was a burial plot on the other side of this field, chained off, two, two burial plots. So I kind of climbed down, went back outside, and I walked over to, to see who they were. I, I assumed that's where D.L. Moody was, and it was. It was he and his wife, their bodies. They were buried right there on the grounds. And on D.L. Moody's headstone is 1 John 2, 17. The last part of the verse. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. I'm thankful that my salvation doesn't depend upon me. I'm thankful that I will live on for eternity in heaven with my Lord. I will abide forever. But the Bible speaks of our works abiding. If any man's work abide, I don't want to suffer loss in that day of judgment. I want my, my life, my life, I will abide forever. 
Because January 7th, 1989, I repented of my sin and I asked Jesus Christ to be my Savior. I will abide forever. I did the will of God. But I want my works to follow. I want what I live for to last for eternity. I believe D.L. Moody embodied that. His life has been described as a man who took two continents, Europe and North America, and shook them for the Lord. He said under his ministry, millions of people placed their faith and trust in Christ for their salvation. That's what I want. I will probably never be like similar to D.L. Moody, comparable to D.L. Moody in any way. And that's fine with me. You know why? Because God didn't make me D.L. Moody. God didn't make you D.L. Moody. But you know what he did? He made you his child. And you and I, we can live our lives for him. Let's bring other people to Jesus Christ. Christians tonight, is there not a cause? Is there not a cause that all the earth may know there's a God in Israel? Will you live for that cause? To multiply worshipers of the true and living God? To share the gospel of Christ with those you know, with those you don't know. Will you live a life that truly counts for Jesus? With our heads bowed and our eyes closed.